Welcome to the NWATC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, uh, Dr. Brian Wood, for the presentation today. Brian? Thanks, Kent. Today, I'm going to talk about pneumocystis pneumonia, or PCP, and I've split this talk into two parts because there was so much information. So today, this is what I'm going to talk about. A little bit of background in biology, risk factors for PCP, the way it usually clinically presents, and some issues with diagnosis. Next week, I'll talk about prevention, including the prophylaxis for PCP, as well as treatment. So we'll start with just some background and biology. I think pneumocystis is a fascinating organism. It was first identified in 1909 by Carlos Chagas, who thought it was part of the life cycle of Chagas disease, or American trypanosomiasis, because he found it in the lungs of patients with that condition. In 1912, it was recognized as a separate organism and first named Pneumocystis carinii by Antonio Carini, the second person who identified it. And then following World War II, it really was an incredibly rare condition that mostly caused pneumonia in premature and malnourished infants and uh, children receiving chemotherapy. And then as you all know, in the 80s and 90s, it really changed and became a leading cause of death in patients with AIDS. It was initially thought to be a protozoa because it has cyst and trophozoite and sporozoite forms, but then in the late 1980s, it was definitively, definitively classified as a fungus based on cell wall structure and uh, other genetic analyses. And what's now known is that each mammalian species is infected with a unique strain of pneumocystis. So pneumocystis carinii is now uh, the classification for the form of pneumocystis that infects rats, and pneumocystis urovetsi, which is the uh, pronunciation, urovetsi is the species that infects humans. One uh, very small point, but point of confusion, is that it is still okay to refer to pneumocystis as PCP for pneumocystis pneumonia, or you will also see PJP in the literature, and both are acceptable. It's an infection that occurs worldwide, and the interesting thing is that we are all exposed to this, and most humans are colonized by infancy. It probably causes uh, just a, um, a very mild URI-like syndrome in healthy infants, and over two-thirds of people are colonized. There's a lot of debate over whether active disease represents reactivation of that uh, colon colonization or new infection. And initially, it was thought that it was nearly all reactivation. And that's because, as I mentioned, almost all are colonized by infancy and because active pulmonary disease occurs if you take animals and immunosuppress them. However, now this balance has sort of shifted towards thinking that most cases, or at least a large percentage of cases, may be new infection. And that's because in animal studies, animals develop infection when they're exposed to other animals with pneumocystis infection, which implies an airborne route of transmission. Repeat infection in humans is often different strains, so not the same strain, which would imply that it's new infection. And there have been studies showing that clusters of cases all have the same genotype, meaning clusters amongst humans probably are all uh, sort of passing it between themselves, which also argues for an airborne route of transmission. So some risk factors for pneumocystis, the key here is immunosuppression. In the multicenter AIDS cohort study, or which is also called MAX, the incidence of PCP with a CD4 count above 200, or between 201 and 350, was only 0.5%. So it's a very rare condition when the CD4 count is above 200. However, within six months of following below 200, the incidence is was 8.4% in this study. Within 12 months of following below 200, the incidence was 18.4%. Of course, this is without adequate prophylaxis. And what I think is a very important point is that within six months of developing thrush, the incidence was nearly 30%. And this and other studies have shown that thrush is a very, very important marker for PCP risk. Thrush indicates advanced immunosuppression and a high risk of developing pneumocystis pneumonia. 
What I think is probably more minor is possible environmental factors. There have been some studies showing that PCP is more likely with uh, warmer outdoor temperatures, with higher sulfur dioxide levels. Uh, there was one trial showing that carbon monoxide levels might be somewhat protective, but I think overall that's probably um, a more minor contribution, but there may be some environmental factors that come into play. And then as I mentioned, there's a lot of data indicating that PCP is, uh, or pneumocystis is probably transferred by the airborne route, and so there's a lot of debate about uh, how much exposure to infected persons or even colonized persons raises the risk for PCP. And I'll talk about this more next week, but there's a lot of debate about whether patients with PCP should be isolated or at least separated from other persons with immunosuppression. I'll get into that more next week when we talk about prevention. The most important risk factors, and I've mentioned a couple of these, low CD4 count below 200 or a CD4 percentage below 14%. Also a previous episode of PCP or as I mentioned, oral thrush is a very important risk factor. So let's turn then to the clinical manifestations and talk about how PCP usually presents. The symptoms in persons with HIV are usually subacute, which is different than in persons who are immunosuppressed due to uh, transplant or due to chemotherapy, in which it can be much more of an acute respiratory illness. The most common symptoms of PCP are fever, Dyspnea, which is often referred to as doorstop dyspnea, or I've also heard it referred to as a doorstop cough, which really means that when patients try to take a deep breath, they can't. They feel like they're getting stopped, like by a doorstop. And that's <clears throat> not a sensitive sign, but is important to ask patients about because it may indicate PCP. Cough is usually dry. Patients can have pleuritic chest pain or malaise. And then the most common signs include hypoxia, especially with exertion. Patients with PCP may not appear hypoxic when they're at rest, but a desaturation of greater than or equal to 5% is an important sign that they could have PCP. Other signs that occur, tachypnea, excuse me, tachycardia. On exam, uh, the most common is inspiratory crackles, and an elevated AA gradient is also an important indicator. But importantly, the chest exam may be normal in up to 50% of people with PCP. The chest x-ray findings, I'm sure you've seen some of these, but most commonly you'll see diffuse, bilateral, hazy, or butterfly infiltrates, and I'll show you some examples. One important thing to remember is that pneumothorax in a person with HIV is PCP until proven otherwise. And then I listed some of the other possible findings for PCP on chest x-rays here. Really, it has been described to do just about everything. And the important thing to remember is that the chest x-ray can be normal in up to 25% of people with PCP. The, uh, a high-resolution CAT scan sh should still show abnormalities even if the chest x-ray is normal in somebody who has uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. So let's look at a couple of x-rays. This is a young man I followed who had a lot of difficulty with adherence to his meds and to his prophylaxis who came in dyspneic and hypoxic. And you can see this very classic bilateral, hazy, butterfly-shaped infiltrate. This is very classic for PCP. This is a young woman I followed who also had been non-adherent to her meds. And you can see, not quite as classically, but you can still get a sense of the bilateral infiltrates here. And then she was put on treatment for PCP and didn't respond. And a week later, this is what her chest x-ray looked like. And you still get a sense of these bilateral infiltrates. But now you start to see these, these suggestions of cyst-like structures here on both sides. And when we look at her CAT scan, you can see these large nematoceles, these sort of thin-walled blebs or cysts. These also are classic for more advanced pneumocystis pneumonia, and that's where it gets the, the name pneumocystis because of these large cysts. Here's one more view of her CAT scan. You can see how large these cysts can get. This was a very interesting patient that I uh, followed here at Harborview who uh, had very advanced disease and you presented much more acutely with acute dyspnea and hypoxia. And what you see here is the outline of his 
lung and a large pneumothorax. So again, pneumothorax in someone with advanced HIV is PCP until proven otherwise. And then interestingly, once he had his chest tube placed and the lung expanded, you can see these butterfly-like infiltrates much more clearly. Um, he had PCP as well as a couple of other opportunistic infections um, and a very, very rocky course. This was his CAT scan. You can see the chest tube now clearly, uh, the pneumothorax, which is still there but much smaller, and then uh, some sort of smaller blebs or cysts in this dense infiltrate. So let's then turn to diagnosis of PCP and talk about a couple of issues. One important thing to remember about PCP is that, it, uh, excuse me, about pneumocystis is that it can't be cultured. So the gold standard for diagnosis really relies on identification of the cysts or the trophozoites on stains of respiratory secretions or rarely of tissue. The, one of the first steps in diagnosis when you suspect PCP is an induced sputum. Sensitivity ranges for induced sputum all the way from less than 50% to 90% depending on the study and really depending on where they are performed. It depends on uh, the person obtaining the induced sputum, the effort of the patient, and the ability of the lab to read the induced sputum. Generally, if an induced sputum is negative for PCP, repeat isn't going to help very much. There's some mixed data about that. One trial from India sh showed that there was improvement by repeating. A trial from here in the U.S. showed there was not improvement. And really, I think it depends on how good that first sample is. In a lot of centers here in the U.S. which have, um, which perform that first sample very well, there's really not much improvement by repeating. And I think if there's a negative induced sputum, going to bronchoscopy with BAL is the right next step. Bronchoscopy with BAL increases the sensitivity to 90 to 99 percent, and then rarely a transbronchial or open bio lung biopsy is required, and that improves the sensitivity even more. In terms of non-invasive tests, there's a few that, uh, that are available. Um, serology is really not used because, again, mo most adults will be positive, and it really just doesn't help. LDH is very nonspecific, may have slightly better sensitivity, but it's very nonspecific. And in general, I don't think helps that much. There's a couple studies that have shown that higher LDH levels may be of prognostic value or that rising LDHs may be of prognostic value. But really, I don't find the LDH to be that helpful um, with the diagnosis, perhaps if it's borderline and you're just looking for more data. There's a, Growing literature about PCR, although it's not commercially available, it may be something that is available in the future. The biggest problem is that PCR is so sensitive, it's hard to know that a positive result indicates infection versus colonization. Higher levels of PCR may be more indicative of infection, but really we need more data and we need a commercially available test. The test that I think is going to become more widely used is the beta-glucan, primarily because it's a non-invasive test that is becoming more readily available. Um, when I was in fellowship, Paul Sachs and I did a study where we looked at patients in the ACTG 5164 trial, which was a trial comparing early versus later treatment of opportunistic infections, and we looked at all those patients in that trial who had a beta-glucan and had respiratory symptoms, and we looked at whether or not they had PCP, and we found a sensitivity of almost 93%, slightly lower specificity, but a very high positive predictive value of 96.3%, and a negative predictive value of 60%. What I've found in talking to people about beta-glucan is that it, it is very helpful if, it's, if there's a fast turnaround time in getting the result. For centers where it's still a send out, where there's going to be a long delay getting it, it probably is not going to be that useful, particularly if you, particularly if you can get a bronchoscopy and BAL even quicker. For centers who are running it in-house, who can get a result within 24 or 48 hours, it's really made a difference in diagnosing PCP. And I think uh, once it becomes more widely used and is done in-house in more centers, uh, more will start using it. So just to summarize the diagnostic evaluation, 
Of course, starting with a chest X-ray makes sense if it's normal and there's a high specification for PCP. A high-resolution chest CT can be very helpful. Remember that about 25% of cases of PCP have a normal chest X-ray, but there generally are still abnormalities on the chest CT. And ABG is very useful. Um, both with diagnosis and with determining if a person needs corticosteroids as part of their treatment, and I'll talk more about that next week. I talked about beta-glucan, which I think is very useful if there's a fast turnaround time, particularly if it's run in-house. If it's a send-out, it's going to take a week to come back, then it's probably not going to be useful. And I talked about some of the um, advantages and disadvantages of LDH. An induced sputum is generally the next step if there's suspicion for PCP. Remember that a, an expectorated sputum, a non-induced sputum, really isn't useful and has, because it has such a low sensitivity. But an induced sputum is the right next step. If that's negative, what I do is I go right to bronchoscopy or BAL. If you're in an area where the induced sputum uh, isn't uh, performed that well, you don't have much confidence, you could consider repeating it. But really, I think in, in most cases, the right next step is going to bronchoscopy and BAL. And if there's still a high suspicion, it's still unclear, then lung biopsy uh, is the final step in that process. Um, this photo is an immunofluorescence of pneumocystis um, uh, from a respiratory sample. So I will stop there and take any questions, and next week we'll move on to the prevention and treatment of pneumocystis.